Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 25th to the 1st of December. I'm Ezzy Pearson, the magazine's features editor, and I'm joined on the podcast today by Katrin Rayner. Hello, Katrin. Hi, Ezzy. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Been lots of great things to see in the night sky over the last couple of weeks. So what do we have as we see out November and start making our way into December? Well, as we come to the end of November, as you said, we're waiting on December and Christmas. Um, we have a waning moon this week, and it's also the best time to see Jupiter in the early morning sky. Mars is in a wonderful position, very close to the beehive cluster M44, which is in Cancer, and there is another moon shadow transit on Jupiter. So, the moon. On the 27th in the early morning, a very thin waning crescent moon is near one of the brightest stars in the sky, Speaker which is in the constellation of Virgo, and it is the brightest star in Virgo. They're going to be above the eastern horizon after 4am and washed out by the sun, which rises at around 7.50am. But if you also enjoy hunting and tracking asteroids, I haven't mentioned one for a few weeks. Mm. I did notice that Vesta is hanging around still, magnitude 8, and this is going to be around 10 degrees, if my calculations are correct, above the moon. And... You know, we did speak a while back about a couple of asteroids and Mary mentioned about tracking them, didn't she? So, yeah, you know, we have said asteroids are really hard to spot. Yes. Vesta is the second largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. The biggest is Ceres, which is a dwarf planet. It's very, Mm -hmm. very big. Vesta is still pretty big, but it's still at plus eight. That's not naked eye. You need a telescope. You need binoculars to be able to track it. The best way to be able to track these really is by taking photographs. If you take a photograph of the same area of sky night after night and then or even a couple of hours apart and then you, what you do is called a blink comparison where you quickly flick between one or the other and they used to have special devices to do this but now there's apps that do that. Yes. <laughs> so course. find one of those <laughs> and they'll match up all the other stars and if you can see one thing moving in the night sky that's your asteroid. And so that's one of the best ways to track them. Like an asteroid flip book. Exactly. Yeah, it's cool. (laughs) Or if you want a a more sort of retro way of doing it, draw a picture. Yeah. Try and draw all of the bright points of light within that field of view. And then again, in a couple of hours or a couple of days later, and see if you can see any that have moved out of the way. And speaking of sketching, actually, I mean, I have done some in, you know, a while ago, They weren't great, but a friend of mine was sharing some of his sketches with me last week. Oh my gosh, they were amazing. Mm. It's like really amazing illustrations of what he'd managed to see through his telescope. I was really, really impressed. There are some absolutely amazing ones I've seen out there of people doing on black paper with chalk pencils and things like that. And they look absolutely stunning, particularly of craters on the moon trying to get the shadows and lights there because when you're looking at the moon it can sometimes feel like very black and white yeah so that works really well if you're trying to sketch something that's just along the terminator they just look like black and white pictures like photographs oh yeah some people it's like that's that can't be a sketch that's just impossible that's wow (laughs) yeah are you sure that's real (laughs) yeah it's not photograph. one thing i will say is because i am a bit of an artist even (laughs) if i don't tend to, to draw the moon too much it takes practice it's always like, okay. don't expect to have these amazing photo real things immediately. Your first couple will be rubbish and then your next two will be slightly less rubbish and so on yeah. and so forth. You just <laughs> have to keep plugging away at them and you'll slowly get better over time. It just, that's just how you have to do it. And like, you know, patience really is the key for astronomy, isn't it? It's, oh, yeah. it's waiting for the sky to clear, waiting to see something, taking photographs, doing some sketches. You do have to be a very patient mm-hmm. person, I think, in all aspects of astronomy. So yeah, absolutely. Yes. Maybe that'll be my new hobby in the new year, mm-hmm. sketching. The moon. <laughs> the new it's resolution. certainly a lot cheaper to get into than <laughs> oh, yeah. astrophotography. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. The camera, the software, and the time, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot, isn't it? So 
Yes, the 1st of December, we have a new moon. So yay for dark skies. The moon is out of the way. Solar system wise, on the 26th of November, we have another shadow transit to look out for tonight, but this time it is on Jupiter, not Saturn. So the moon Io transits the gas giant and can be spotted in the middle of the planet at around 7.50 p.m. when Jupiter will be around 25 degrees above the eastern horizon. So quite well placed, really, to see it. And then on the 30th, the best time to see Jupiter is on this early morning. It's high in the southern sky at approximately 60 degrees overhead at around 12.40 a.m. So if you cast your eyes downwards from Jupiter, again, you'll see the almighty Orion shining below and Mars can be located further east around 40 degrees overhead. So we spoke about this area of the sky last yeah. week, didn't we? It's just obviously it's not changing. There's a lot going on over there. I mean, it's not even that far away to the Pleiades. So there's a lot to be seeing at that time. And also 12.40, that's not at a particularly unsociable hour. That might just be me talking because no. I usually don't go to bed until midnight anyway. Yeah. But, <laughs> There's um... no excuse now. You can stay up for an extra 40 minutes to see it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and even if it's you're just like a bit earlier, it will still be very high in the sky around those times. So it's a great time to get out there and see Jupiter and Orion. That's it. And it's just because the planet's obviously quite high up as well, it's good that you don't really have to find somewhere you know, it's got a clear horizon yeah. or anything like that. It's really good view. Because the, particularly with the planets, but the higher something is in the sky, that means it's further away from the horizon. It's further away from that kind of soupy atmosphere where the heat of the day dissipating makes the atmosphere seem to wobble like a mirage, it makes the seeing very bad, it's called. Yes. But when it's up high in the sky, much more stable, much clearer to see. That doesn't mean you can't see it when it's closer to the horizon, but particularly with the planets, they are much better viewed when they're high up. Yeah, so we expect to see a lot of good pictures being sent in now, don't we, Essie, <laughs> for <Yes>. November? <laughs> if anybody has any, please send them in to contact us at skynightmagazine.com. We love to have your photos every month. So we were just saying, you know, Jupiter's is the best time to see the gas giant on the 30th, where well, it's also the best time to see Venus. So over the month, it has been brightening and it can now be seen at magnitude minus four. And it's going to set around three hours after the sun has disappeared below the western horizon. It's going to be quite low on the horizon, but if you have a clear, uninterrupted view, it's going to be easy to spot. I mean, it's unmistakable, really, isn't it? It's yeah. very bright and shiny. So Minus four is very, very bright. It is, yeah. <laughs> you don't get a lot of things that are in the minuses to begin with. And then, so, and minus four is very, is very bright. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine you might even be able to see it kind of, when the sky isn't, you know, properly dark, really, probably as the sun setting, you might be able to start. If you can, got... you can sometimes see Venus mm -hmm. during the day. Usually, is you can only see it sort of like when it's next to the moon because that's drawing your eye to the right area of the sky. But Venus is one of those ones where, unfortunately, it does tend to be close to the horizon mm -hmm. because we are looking towards the sun. So that means by the time the sun sets, it's also about to set and yeah. similar with when it's rising and the sun's rising which is a shame but that's how these things work yeah we can't do anything about it unfortunately we can't do anything yeah. about geometry and physics no. unfortunately <laughs> as much as we might want to just make do with what's there and, mm -hmm. uh, and try our best at trying to see everything and lo and behold on the 30th it's also the best time of the month to see mars so yeah, so the 30th is the best time to see Jupiter, Venus and Mars. So the 30th is the day to put in the calendar this week. That's it, yeah. Be good for the planet. So Mars is going to be located high in the south in the early hours of the morning. What, very early hours or late? I don't know. I mean, however you look at it. So just after 4 a.m. And last week we mentioned that Mars could be located close to M44, the beehive cluster. And on the 30th, the red planet will be just two degrees from the heart of the beehive cluster. So this is going to be a lovely photography opportunity. So just to clarify on that one, it's the night of the 29th heading into the 30th. It'll be the early hours of that morning. <laughs> so yeah, so make sure you get out and view that. So, and no hope of seeing Mercury this week as it's not visible in the twilight. So poor old Mercury's, he's uh, not in the spotlight. No, I'm sure he'll be back soon. They always are. Yes, yes, we hope so. <laughs> and yeah, and the comet. So we have Comet A3, Sushan Chan Atlas. It's fading. You know, we keep saying it's fading. Well, it's just 
getting dimmer. <laughs> <laughs> it will be higher in the sky as the month ends. Mm. And it's going to be a magnitude of plus 9.3 by the end of the week. It's rubbish. Yeah, it is definitely past its best. But if people have been tracking it throughout its journey, I don't think there's any reason why you should stop now. You've watched it as it got brighter. People do tend to forget about these things once they're starting to fade away. But I think that's just as interesting. Again, if people are, have been taking photographs of it. That's it. You don't want to just have it sort of making its journey up until it's being bright and then there's nothing. You want <laughs> yeah. to have the whole way through. So keep going. The whole shebang. Yeah, so I mean, even I think, well, just to say really, you know, it's going to be a, a small telescope target at this point and it's you can find it in the constellation of Aquila. But yeah, I mean, even if I haven't managed to see it by this point, which I hope I have, I would still, even though I know it's kind of fading, if it was a clear night and I had, you know, I was out and about and I would still and try and find it if possible. So yeah, although it's fading, it's still worth trying to get a glimpse of for sure. And yeah, deep sky wise, just because we are entering December, we touched upon Orion last week. We will be mentioning the hunter a lot throughout the coming season I think we are heading into the Orion months yeah <laughs> it's just you know as we said last week it's just a, a real favorite isn't it for amateur and well-seasoned observers and we have a really kind of long period of seeing Orion so I think it's is it mid-November we can start seeing it but then it doesn't disappear from the northern hemisphere until March so it's a good it's few months up for most of the winter that's it, yeah. So, you know, you'll probably be fed up of hearing about Orion. Just eye roll, uh, Orion again. But yeah, just to finish off, really, as we enter December, you know, just to talk about the Orion Nebula, it's a fantastic target, which lies in the centre of Orion's sword, which is a shorter vertical line of three fainter stars, which hangs down from Orion's belt. The nebula looks like the middle star of the sword to the naked eye. So, I mean, that's really important. You can see it with the naked eye. Mm. You don't need binoculars or a telescope. So, yeah, I mean, you can tell you're looking at the nebula because it's a little bit fuzzier than the stars above and below it. It's composed of dust and gas. And yes, it's a great pit stop for beginners as well. I really like the Orion Nebula because you can see it at every level. Yeah. You can just about make out that there's some kind of fuzzy blob there with the yes. naked eye yeah. or at least I can convince myself I can. <laughs> you're sure you'll see it definitely <laughs> <laughs> and then you look through a pair of binoculars and you can begin to see that it's got this shape to it and then you look through a telescope and you can see even more detail and then you take a photo and you see even more detail so wherever you are in your astronomy journey mm -hmm. you can look at Orion's nebula and get a different view of it it's just a great all-rounder constellation, really, isn't it? Yes. Orion, because it's so easy to spot. And like you said, just seeing a nebula with your naked eye, it's fantastic. I will warn people, especially if you're used to seeing all of these incredible pictures where it's, you know, Orion's nebula in this lovely pink bloom. It doesn't look like that through a telescope, unfortunately. They're usually a lot dimmer. You can't see nearly as much detail. The, the colour won't be there either. That doesn't mean it's not a beautiful thing to look at. That doesn't mean it's not something you should be looking at. It's yeah. just, you know, make sure that you go in prepared for what it is that you're going to see. Because it is completely different. It might not be, you know, these wonderful Hubble pictures that you see in magazines and books. But it's something that you are seeing with your own eyes. You know, the photons of light are coming directly from that nebula across, what was it, 1,344 light years and coming to your eye. Yeah. And that, to me, is, is what really sells it. It's amazing. I mean, even just in the garden, if I'm looking at the Andromeda galaxy, say, through my Dobsonian, you know, obviously it's through that, as you say, it's not a Hubble telescope image, but it still gives you that, oh, wow, you know, mm. I found it and I can see it. And, yeah, it's something... I don't think people can actually really be prepared for when they see these things. So, yeah, you know, like I said, I'm sure we'll be talking about Orion's nebula a lot more and, and telling people how to view it and, and what to expect. So, yes. So that's that. And if listeners at home want to make sure that you catch those episodes where we talk even more about Orion, please subscribe to the Star Diary podcast and we'll be back here next week with even more stargazing highlights.
But to summarise this week again, the moon is still going to be waning all week. On the 26th, Io is going to transit Jupiter, giving us the opportunity to see the moon shadow on the gas giant. You can observe the planet at around 7.50pm to see the shadow on the centre of Jupiter. On the 27th, in the early morning, a very thin waning crescent moon is near one of the brightest stars in the sky, Speaker. They will be above the eastern horizon after 4am and washed out by the sun, which rises at around 7.50. On the 30th, it's time to see the three planets at their best in November. Jupiter, Mars and Venus are all going to be on show. Mars and Jupiter are best seen in the early hours of the morning, whilst Venus is visible in the evening. Mars will also be just two degrees from the centre of the Beehive Cluster in Cancer. Saturn is also visible all week, but unfortunately Mercury is not visible in our skies at the moment. Coma A3 Susan Shan Atlas is now a small telescope target only. By the beginning of December, it will have faded to a magnitude 9.3. And finally, Orion, our old favourite, is back in the night sky. Whether you're an amateur or a well-seasoned observer, there's lots to see in that constellation. And especially when you start turning your optical aids towards the nebula as well. So lots of things to be getting on with that week. Thank you very much for taking us through all of that, Katrin. It's much appreciated. And we will be back next week with Mary McIntyre to go through even more goings on in the night sky. So until then, thank you for listening and goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Thank you.